We are live. Good morning, everybody. It's Lisa Salberg, and thank you for joining us on our Facebook page live today for this episode of Tales from the Heart, a podcast by the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. Today, I'm going to read a little disclaimer before we get started and introduce our guest for the day. Today's podcast is sponsored in part by Bristol Myers Squibb, Cytokinetics, Embryo Pharmaceuticals, and Tenaya Therapeutics. When we offer a sponsorship to our partners, we offer them an opportunity to come here with their senior leadership to participate in a podcast. I want to be very clear and very transparent that the HCMA sets the questions and they agree to answer them. So saying no more on that, I wish to welcome Faraz Ali, the CEO of Tanaya Therapeutics. Good morning. Good morning, Lisa. Thanks Thank for you for me. joining us. I'm going to get rid of my little speaker in the ear there because I don't need it anymore. So um, I've asked you to come here today because Tanaya Therapeutics is doing some really interesting and exciting work in the fields of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'm hoping that as we all evolve together in our understanding of HCM and how we treat it in the future, that we all have an understanding of where these companies are coming from that are developing these therapeutics, who the people are behind the companies, and why patients should be listening carefully to what's being said now. So that being said, let's start with the personal and figure out how you landed in the position of CEO at Tanaya. Well, uh, thank you, Lisa, for the uh, opportunity to, to do this. Uh, and um, thanks to all the people who are joining here today. Um, first, I just want to say, Lisa, this is a wonderful idea. Um, we all are ultimately, you know, we'll talk about science, we'll talk about HCM, but we're ultimately people. And uh, there, there are people who are living with certain conditions, and they're um, including some who will be listening today. And there are people like us who are trying to work on those conditions. And um, the more people I truly come from a school of thought that the more people hear from each other, you said here, people should, patients should be listening to us and we should be listening to them. Absolutely. So the more we talk to each other, that just results in, um, a better mutual understanding, deeper understanding. Um, you find common ground. I think that ultimately leads to better medicines as well. Um, so you have to go through a process of listening. Um, I'm, I'm not a big fan as many people know of too much remote work. I like meeting people in person. I got to meet you in your office, uh, you know, not that long ago. Uh, but I also love the utility of platforms like this to get to a broader reach of people who you can't possibly meet in person. So what a wonderful idea that you've been doing uh, for a while here, Lisa. And I'm really glad that tonight I can now be part of uh, that. So me personally, um, uh, I'll, I'll just walk at a high level. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, I come from a family that cares a lot about uh, doing good in the world. Um, and, uh, and so that's always been a motivation for me. I have an interest in innovation. Uh, I have this um, uh, desire to do things that few other people are doing. I hate following a crowd. Uh, and that ends up having relevance in my career and how we got here at Tanaya. Uh, and I also have this um, stubborn support for the underdog. Again, sort of that idea that there are people who, um, uh, need a voice and aren't being heard and uh, and deserve to be rooted for. And uh, and that is a sort of a deeply rooted personal um, uh, characteristic. And that does also influence sort of the direction that my career has taken. Um, I also had the benefit of going to some very, very good schools. Uh, I was lucky. And I feel with that came an obligation to do something important with that and contribute to the well-being of society. So those are my personal motivations. Um, professionally, the path to getting to Tanaya and, and being the CEO here, it really, I have to say, starts with uh, the time that I spent at a company called Genzyme. Genzyme uh, doesn't even exist anymore. It's now part of Sanofi, a large pharmaceutical company. They got bought, I think, around 2011, but I joined in 2001. And they, what made them unique was a focus on rare conditions, rare diseases, at a time where very few people were interested and medicines and developing medicines for rare conditions. Um, it was considered to be too difficult, wasn't considered to be particularly profitable. How are you gonna make a lot of money on a small number of patients? Um, and uh, those sort of were, I think what Genzyme and the leadership there did was say, wait a second, we have the science to address these patients and their needs. There's unmet need, there, there's 
there's death and disability here and we have the science. Let's not get things like profit and business model get in the way of addressing that. You know, if we do what's right for these patients, then we'll figure out how to make a business out of it. And that's what they did. And they did that globally. So that experience that I had working at Genzyme where, you know, they were doing, uh, they had operations in 40 countries. They were making their therapies available in many cases for free all over the world, you know, in 60 plus countries. Um, that was deeply in my DNA because it fit with that idea of doing the things that nobody else was willing to do, supporting the underdog, which is in this case was the rare disease uh, patient community, um, and a really patient-centric culture. Um, that um, So that, that left a, a lasting imprint on me uh, and it influences my thinking to this day. And we'll talk about how that can, you know, led to my time at Tanaya. Uh, so that was one important uh, step in my journey. Another really important step in my journey was going to a co small company called Bluebird Bio. It's a gene therapy company in Boston. And um, over there, uh, the, the mission of rare diseases that I had deeply rooted in me met some fascinating new science. The idea that you, can, you might be able to cure certain genetic disorders with a growing armament of different types of tools, I'll call them science platforms. Um, that was fascinating that the science had matured enough that you actually could see benefits in patients that a single dose of a therapy could correct the problems associated with a genetic defect and then you'd never have to dose again. That idea of a one-time potential curative therapy, I first you know, got exposure to that uh, back in about a decade ago at Bluebird Bio who now have recently had a string of successes with some approvals uh, that told me this is not just science fiction, this can be done. But again, the questions were, well, how do you make a business out of a one-time potential cure? Because the traditional pharmaceutical model is to treat people for the rest of their life, chronically administered. So let's diseases. pause there first. Yeah. Because this is, this is science meeting economics, mm -hmm. meeting population medicine, yeah. meeting chronic disease, rare disease, and really turning things a bit on its head. And as a early adopter of disruptive medicine, mm -hmm. um, I, I love the idea of looking at it from a different lens. Yeah. And here we are figuring out how to make a good business model so that we can afford to do the discovery, be safe, do the due diligence, and produce something that makes a an astounding difference in the lives of those with genetic disorders. So, you know, we we talked a bit, or you talked a bit about your background, and can you explain what like what coursework did you take to learn the business? <laughs> to get and then, there? You know, for these young people saying, hey, I want to do that someday. How did you figure out these complexities between science and business and put them together? Yeah, that's a, so I, I, I was skipping over those steps maybe. Uh, um, look, my in terms of background, I, uh, I, um, I was um, an engineer in college. Um, and I wasn't thinking of going into medicine or, you know, that was just wasn't part of, uh, I had the idea of doing good in the world. I loved innovation, as I mentioned, but I thought I was going to do it in the engineering context. And, um, and then uh, at uh, some point in college, I came, I, I took some, I was fascinated by the brain in, you know, there was, uh, I have some family members who are affected by conditions that you might describe as rare and, um, and that um, got me thinking harder about human health and, and then got me thinking harder about how do I apply all this stuff I'm doing in engineering and computer science and, and all those things to health, right? sort of where the idea first came about. And, um, and so that got me going down the path of essentially what would be called a biomedical engineering degree. Back then it didn't exist, uh, at least not at the institution I was at, um, but I combined technology, computer science, electrical engineering and biology and said, I want to make a, a, a career out of applying new science to areas of unmet need and health and, um, and doing good to society. That's what I, I figured out I wanted to do. That's what college is for. And that's part of what I figured out for myself. 
Um, and so that got me down the, the healthcare path. I was uh, I was actually at a big company called GE Healthcare for a while. And so that was very far from drug development. That was more, think about um, CAT scans and x-rays and medical imaging uh, systems. Diagnostics and, versus Diagnostics, therapy. electronic medical records, hospital information systems. Uh, I started down that path. Um, and then, uh, and then I became interested in the business side of things through some experiences. And then uh, that partly brought me to a graduate school. I studied business uh, and, and I, I, business school was a period of time where I decided, hmm, I know I like innovation. I know I like healthcare. I've gotten interested in the, in the business side of things as well. And there's some tough nuts to crack. You use the term disruptive technology. One of my professors, um, uh, Professor Clay Christensen was one of the people who coined the term, kind of wrote the book on disruptive innovation. And that just electrified me. The idea that sometimes the best technology, or in this case, the best science, doesn't move forward, not because the science doesn't work, but because people can't figure out how to turn that into a business, or it challenges the existing business model. And, um, and so I got really fascinated by that idea that fit with my sense of doing things that people haven't done before, that sense of innovation um, in the context of so, so it was engineering, a little bit of science and business. That's what led me into this, this industry. Uh, in the context of Genzyme, it was a business. It was partly science, partly unmet need, but partly how do you make a business out of treating patients with rare disease globally, doing it in a way that's not just for the rich in the US or Europe, but you can provide drug, make a way to provide medicines, life-saving medicines, in far-flung places like Peru to Pakistan to the Philippines, right? And, and so we did that. Uh, and so that was a great experience there. And the context of Bluebird and gene therapy, and we'll come to Tanaya then, it was, again, this idea of, wait, the, the existing paradigm is that you, you're, you're, you're treating people for the rest of their life. And and the company's business model, especially big pharmaceutical companies, is we give this medication day after day, week after week, month after month, in some cases, year after year for the rest of your life. Think about insulin for diabetes, right? Or, um, or statin lowering for cholesterol. And you make money doing that. And that's, you know, you're doing good. You're helping. You're doing good. Health. Therapeutic. But how do you do it when it's a one-time cure? And, and I got some reactions to when I went into gene therapy, people saying, well, why would you do that? I'm like, well, why wouldn't I do that? Well, well, because like, how do you make money doing that? Like, it's a cure. You know, they're, like, how do you make money doing the cure? And it seemed like the most, um, the absolute wrong way to think about it, that um, the, if the science exists to do well for patients and for the healthcare system and for society, follow the science, and then figure out the business. And so that's part of, I think, my DNA. And, and, um, and so along the way, I've spoken quite a bit over time in different jobs and roles about this intersection of science, health, and economics. And, and, and that is relevant, I think, very much, very much relevant uh, when we talk about tonight and the kind of science we're advancing. So does that answer your question, Lisa? It does answer the question, and I think it opens up a, a whole bunch of other ones as, as we delve in here a little That's bit. what we're here for. So um, you brought up some really tantalizing topics, curing disease, curing genetic diseases. Um, I used to refer to that as the C word, and I wouldn't utter it. I used to use the word eradication. I wish to eradicate HCM mm -hmm. because I didn't think the word cure fit us because of the mechanism of disease. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm changing my vocabulary and I'm starting to get comfortable with the concept that for some, for some, a cure might be obtainable. We're not there yet. And I'm saying some very tantalizing things to this community and they're listening carefully. And before we dive in any further to understand a little bit about the team that Tanaya is and who is there, mm -hmm. I wanna be clear on a couple things to set expectations. Sure. For those with identifiable pathogenic gene mutations, 
there might be a path forward. For those with the unidentified or multivariant, multiple genes, that pathway is going to be very different and take much longer. So for those, and, and I'm happy, and that's a weird way to put this, but I'm happy to say I know my gene mutation. Um, I am a myosin binding protein C mutation. It runs in my family and it can go, we can date it back to, you know, the turn of the century, the last century. Um, so for families like mine who have significant disease, as many know, I survived 36 years diagnosed with HCM and went to transplant. You know, I would much rather have my native heart. Thank you very much. But I'm here. So I'm grateful for transplant technology and therapies. But it would have been much nicer to keep that heart in place and probably cost about the same. Um, so setting expectations for yeah. those with an identifiable gene, that's the team that we're going to be talking about and what they're building. Yeah. So let's go back to, um, you know, we understand how you got to where you are. So and... I, I, let me let me complete that then narrative. And I do want to be careful about the word, the C word. And, the C and word. I was, you know, I'm, we were, I was laying out the ideas that moved me and brought me to where I am, but not making any commitments or promises or setting expectations of the therapies that Tanaya is going to advance. So let's make sure we, we cover both. Absolutely. But the idea that with genetic insight and with genetic tools, the possibility had been opened up that was realized, that possibility has been realized now by many companies. There's now approved therapies using different technologies. Um, I don't want to bore the, your audience with, you know, the definitions of AAV gene therapy versus LVV gene therapy versus CRISPR gene editing versus some other form of gene editing. I think there'll be a time and place for all that. But the idea we is that we're holding a webinar on that in the coming months. Yeah, we have a, a, a much better insight about the genetics of, across a whole host of conditions, not only the heart, but uh, other areas where I was before we came to Tanaya. Um, and, uh, and we have that potential, that the possibility of maybe sometimes we don't use the word cure, we say curative. It's moving in that direction or transformative and, and trying to differentiate it from chronically administered therapies where you're not, you are addressing the symptoms of the disease. You're not fixing the underlying cause. If you're fixed the underlying cause, there's that chance, that hope that you start approaching something that could be described as curative. Um, when I came to Tanaya, what brought me to Tanaya to really close the loop here is I had seen rare diseases. I had seen genetic therapies with the possibility of curative effect. And I met the, the, the people who had put together Tanaya back in 2016, and I'll describe Tanaya in a second. And they said, well, we're focused on the heart. And it got me thinking of rare diseases, unmet need, genetic insight, the possibility of genetic tools and applying that to the heart. And as I started peeling back the onion, I hadn't yet, you know, I was going through the interview process for this role, and it just ignited a sense of passion in me that there's something here. And that same passion I felt when I went to Genzyme and rare diseases, and the same passion I felt when I went to Bluebird for gene therapies, my passion got ignited when I learned more about Tanaya and the idea of focusing on the heart, that there was a ton of unmet need here, but people weren't really focused. A lot of big pharmaceutical companies were exiting this space. They were investing less and less in heart disease, and more and more into say oncology or something else. And I'm like, wait, that's a head scratcher. Heart disease is still the leading cause of death in the world. And where are the genetic forms of this? And I'd ask people about that. And I'm like, oh, oh, you know, a lot of really smart people couldn't name for me a single genetic heart condition. And that got me thinking, this is not a lack of unmet. There's, there's clearly unmet need here. It's a lack of imagination and attention. And so the idea of applying the genetic insight, the genetic tools, and bringing it to the leading cause of death in the world and finding those pockets of rare conditions and genetic conditions where you can do some good and nobody else was doing it, very much built on the experiences I had at Genzyme and Bluebird and Regenix Bio, another important gene therapy company, uh, built on my sense of mission, built on the idea of uh, follow, fo focusing on things that nobody else is ready, you know, currently focusing on. Um, and that's what brought me to Tanaya. I was hooked. I'm a, I'm a passionate person. Most people could sense that from the get-go. 
Uh, and I need my passion to be ignited for me to be at my best and do my best. Um, and uh, and that's what I found when I got to Tanaya. And I'm, I'm looking forward to telling uh, your audience more about it. But that's me. That was my background. That's how I got there. And that's what got us thinking about what is the potential of a company and an idea of a, 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 a like Tanaya, that what we represent. So I am um, thinking back to that that timeline. You know, 2014 is when um, I met with Tassos from Myocardia, and we talked about what myosin inhibitors and how we could focus there and what that was going to look like. And we know how that turned out. Um, interestingly, in 2016. Uh, right around this time of year, actually, I was at the White House and we were at a meeting uh, for cardiovascular health in America and what was the roadmap and what we were going to do in the future. And there was a lot of talk about diet and exercise and smoking and fat, salt, and all kinds of other terrible things that we do to ourselves. And I stood up to make a comment about, please think about genetic diseases. Some of us didn't do anything to cause our problems. It was done to us and we need genetic thinking here. And I also almost passed out while making that comment at the White House, and we all know how that story ended with my heart in a box. Um, but it was being floated around that time, you know, 2012 to 2017, and a lot of small companies said, I think we can do something in this space. Genetics is far enough, and, and little waves started to form. And my phone started to ring with different kinds of phone calls. Hey, we're thinking of this. Do you think there's tolerance for this type of therapy in HCM? And yeah, I think I think we need to research it. Um, you have one member of your board who's had uh, quite a few uh, actions in this space and has done tremendously great work by helping develop up these companies. Um, Eli, I'm talking about you. Mm -hmm. um, so he's, he sees it. He has a vision. And he's got a good financial mind and I'm, I'm watching it play out and help this community in, in amazing ways. So um, there are some really insightful people behind the scenes who see our struggle, who see it as not only a good business model, but good for humanity. Mm -hmm. And you can do both. You can make a little money and you could do a good thing and you can stop suffering. And this is what I think is amazing about some of our partners today, yeah. that they get this and that, that we can all work together to make life better. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the Tanaya team. Yeah. Let's kind of start with, you know, visionaries and board members. And then yeah. tell me what kind of people are there building the everyday science and application. Yeah, and I'd love to tell you more about uh, Tanaya. And uh, actually, ironically, you picked, you know, the year 2016. 2016 is where another company called Celadon, um, you know, they were doing gene therapy in the heart, probably many people associated them with the first real effort at gene therapy of the heart. Uh, and, uh, and that effort didn't, was not successful and they folded in 2016. So you would think it's very counterintuitive. Then two years later, I come here to the, the Tanai was founded in 2016. And in 2018, I joined as the first CEO. So against the backdrop of a failure in cardiac gene therapy, yep. why would you say we should think about cardiac gene therapy? Mm -hmm. And you nailed it on the head, Elisa, genetics. So that the Celadon approach was not focusing on particular genetics upset. It was focusing on a general heart failure phenotype not, without uh, necessarily a genetic underpinning. So they were delivering a therapeutic protein and hope that that would do better for people with generalized heart failure. And that part of the insight here is that is perhaps too diffuse an approach. But if you know the underlying genetic condition and then you can deliver a healthy copy of the gene or in the future edit a defective gene, well, gosh, then you might have a more precise effect. And that's what got me excited. And so I didn't, that's why I think people sometimes take the long, the wrong lesson from past efforts that did not work, because the right lesson is going, understanding the genetics, which we now do know for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for dilated cardiomyopathy, for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So Tanaya, founded in 2016. Um, the company was actually named, this is my background, that's Tanaya Peak, and that's Tanaya Lake in Yosemite National Park. So that's not where I am, but that's my background, and that's what the company's named after. Um, 
we were spun out of the Gladstone Institutes. So that's important for a couple of different reasons. Um, we were formed by cardio experts in cardiology and genetics. People were deeply steeped in science. Uh, the early investors, the early board members, the early founders all had a commitment to doing something different in heart disease. And that was an area of focus. They said, let's focus on the heart. This is a big enough problem, a big enough area of unmet need. We don't want to be diffuse. We want to focus on the heart. And so that sentiment was shared among our founders, including Deepak Srivastava at the Gladstone Institute, who's a, who's a you know, uh, in the National Academy, uh, our Eric Olson at UT Southwestern in Texas, um, Eli Kazin, as you know, he came in as an investor, uh, I think in 2019, um, who had some experience investing in genetic disorders. But, you know, Sandy Williams is on our board. He was previously on the board of Bristol Myers Squibb. He's an adult cardiologist and has taught and, and run uh, Duke Medical School. Uh, so I think there's just a lot of really good people who came around the table and said, let's do something different here with a strong commitment to the heart and a strong commitment to um, uh, scientific foundations and, and really build something fresh and new from the bottoms up. So we were literally spun out of the Gladstone Institutes, which is a major academic institution associated with the Uni University of California, San Francisco, right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And our mission was a, is a bold one, which is to discover, develop, and deliver potentially curative therapies that address the underlying causes of heart disease. Discover, that sent the signal that we want to do research, develop, we want to do clinical development, we want to actually test this out in humans, and deliver, we actually want to manufacture and eventually commercialize our own therapies. So the idea of being a fully integrated company is there in our mission. Curative, we're looking for that possibility to leverage human genetics to do things like that, that address the underlying causes of heart disease. It again, sort of hints to that, you know, not all heart disease is the same. They have different pathways and different, the heart fails in different ways. And we want to get to the underlying cause of them. So that's our mission. We are hundred percent focused on the heart. That's not the case, by the way, for everybody. There will be people who probably, who are, who, who your phone was ringing uh, with the names of some people who uh, are working, say in a certain type of technology, not necessarily focused on the heart, but opportunistically are interested in the heart. Uh, or big pharmaceutical companies who are doing everything, oncology, neurology, immunology, and also have some work in heart disease. We are we don't dabble in other therapeutic areas. Maybe we will in the future, but for now, we are 100% focused on the heart. We have a very strong commitment to science. I mean, it's a science first, patients first kind of company. And the significance of that is that we look at something like HCM and we look at the genetics of HCM and say, gosh, to fix that, if you have a defective gene, wouldn't it be great if you could provide a healthy copy of the gene? But if you're looking at say heart attack, which is another area of interest for Tanaya, over there, it's not about a genetic defect. You, you, you had a heart attack and you lost some cells. You, in order to help that patient, you need to somehow regenerate heart tissue that's been lost. That's a very different approach. And that's gonna require a different type of science. Maybe another mutation requires not a addition of a healthy copy of gene, but you need to silence or fix or edit that defective gene to have an effect. The way Tanaya approaches things, we say it's in a modality agnostic fashion. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we want to pick the right tool for the job. So it might be a small molecule. It might be a gene therapy. It might be a gene editing. It might be an antibody. It might be we look at the science and the underlying cause and we try to match it with the right science. And so that makes us unique in several ways. Focus on the heart, we, we pick the right tool for the job and we look at both rare and prevalent forms of heart disease. So we do both. And that makes us quite unique and, and we stick out, I, I like to believe in a good way in the minds of many people uh, because of those uh, things. We're 140 people today. So we're very much a startup entrepreneurial, gritty, you know. Uh, we, roll up your sleeves, get it done. Roll your sleeves, get it done. There's no slack. There's a high sense of mission and passion among the people over here. Uh, most of our people are here in the San Francisco Bay Area, but we have started planting flags in other parts of the of the U.S. and the other parts of the world. 
Wendy Brasari, who's our head of patient advocacy, who I'm sure we'll speak about later. You know, somebody who comes from the HCM community. She lives in Boston and we were, she was the right person for the job. And so we said, you're in Boston, but we want you, we want you to be part of Tanaya. And we've hired somebody in Europe and beginning to engage with the patient community and physician communities in Europe. Most of our people in San Francisco, but as we grow, we are spreading. Um, so that's Tanaya in a nutshell, right? I, hopefully that's helpful for you and helpful for your, um, for your audience to hear the basics. They're, they're a little quiet today in the audience world. I'm like, okay, you can pop questions in whenever you want. But um, Lori, I think you figured out who's speaking by now. And yes, Tim, there's a long lineup of genes that we still need to identify. Um, and that work is not um, ig being ignored. We know that there are other pathways that we need to identify. You know, is it one gene? Is it two? Is it a combination of five genes that are causing some of these HCM presentations. Uh, so the, the science continues to evolve there. Can uh, I, one can of our- I, Can I, to, to, um, it was a Tim or who, I don't know who made yeah. that comment, but um, that's actually one of the great bits of what's going on here at Tanaya. We are actually doing some basic research. We take different types of cell lines. We can take, um, it's, a, it's a mouthful, but human iPSC derived cardiomyocytes. So cardiomyocytes are the cells of the heart, the, the beating part of the heart. We can grow them in a dish and we can, um, we can perturb the genetics. We can silence certain genes. We can augment certain genes. We can edit certain genes in order to mimic the human genetic condition. We can also take cells from patients. So some in the audience, you know, they may have donated their cells to science. We get those. We work with those. That allows us to start interrogating and understanding what are other genetic factors that are impacting that might predict why somebody is getting sick or why something is more sick, uh, you know, than somebody else. Um, and even identify new genes that um, uh, because we're all about genetic validation. So to the point of your the member of your audience who brought that up, that is also the kind of research we're doing here, right here in San Francisco understanding the genetics and pushing the boundaries of understanding of underlying causes of disease, not just the ones that have already been identified and that are well known like MyBC3 or MYH7 um, within the HCM community, but finding others within HCM, within dilated cardiomyopathy, uh, within arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So that's part of Tanaya. That's part of who we are. And that won't be near term. That'll take a while to generate that insight working with experts around the world. But that is very much part of Tanaya's mission. So I am planning um, to be out in the San Francisco area in December, and maybe we can do some mini, mini interviews on site and we can get the team to start talking about some of the stuff they're doing and, and we can organize that out because the community is, now the questions are popping in. They're very, very interested. So I think we've tantalized them enough with the how and the why you are running this uh, organization today and you are the CEO and you've brought in phenomenal board and you've got great scientists and we're moving towards these therapies. But now let's talk a little bit more granularly. Like, okay, I have a myosin binding protein C mutation. That is a current target of interest for Tanaya. Yeah. And that's where we're focusing on as a starting point. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about the project and what the hopes are and what this looks like at this point? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Lisa. And again, I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that your community knows HCM very well. Uh, that's why they're here. I'm gonna presume yep. your community knows myosin binding protein C3, myosin C3 very well, and other mutations. Um, so I won't spend any time on that. Um, the idea that we have, one of our we have several projects, and on our website, I encourage anybody to go to tanayatherapeutics.com. You're going to find a lot of information over there. Um, the, uh, the idea of one of our programs, uh, TN201 is the code that goes with it, is to focus on HCM due to myosin uh, binding protein C3 mutations. And so that's the TN201 program. The, the genetics are clear experts that many of you have been working with for years and decades have paved the way. We stand on the shoulders of those giants. We also stand on the shoulders of giants in genetic therapies who understood and perfected trial and error over decades to get to the point where we think we understand how to take a myosin, a healthy MyBC3 gene, 
package it inside a delivery tool, which we can discuss in a bit, and deliver that to the heart of patients. And that's what TN21 is intended to do. It's a quote unquote lock and key medicine. So you have the defect due to the mutation, we're gonna give you a healthy copy of the gene to try to make up for what is missing, which is that my BBC3 protein. And so that's the intent of TN201 is to deliver a healthy copy of the human, full length human MyBC3 gene to the cells, to the cardiomyocytes of individuals who are affected by this condition. And we've done that in mouse models. We've done that in those cell lines that I described and proven and shared our data at many, many uh, important conferences over time that this is something that appears to be working. It appears that we can deliver the gene. It appears that we can express the full length human MyBC3 gene protein. It appears that that successfully uh, inserts itself into the sarcomere. And then once it does so, it appears that it helps the cells meet better, more like a normal cell. And in our mouse models, improves the heart function, improves the electrophysiology, the electrical currents of it, shrinks the heart to something approaching normal, improves the dimensions, thins the ventricle, and in those mouse models, which are very severe, 100% of the untreated animals will die. 100% of the animals we treated with this myosin binding protein C3 mutations in them survive. So it's great proof of concept that this might be able to work in humans, both in human cell lines, as well as in a mouse model. It seems that delivering a healthy copy of the gene expresses the protein and is beneficial by many, many, many different measures. Um, and that's the excitement at the company to do something. We are um, have engaged with experts around the world. We've ex engaged with regulators uh, or FDA and other similar agencies in other countries around the world. And our public commitment is that by the end of this year, we would have filed what is called an IND, which mm -hmm. is basically a fancy way of saying an application for permission to start dosing patients with TN201 as early as next year. So we'll file the IND this year. And if that application and is approved and that permission is granted, then we would start dosing actual individuals with my VC3 mutations as early as next year. So that's an extremely- So in, in genetic therapy, we have to think about phase one, phase two, phase three trials a little bit differently than with a, an oral medication or yes. a, a biologic. It's a little, it, well, it's a lot different because it's it's a different mechanism. Mm -hmm. You can't really test it in a healthy person because- yes. it, it wouldn't work in a healthy work. person. TN201 would do nothing for a healthy person because it only works in people who have the genetic defect. That's how precise the medicine is. So you couldn't possibly explore this one. So when we talk about starting human studies next year, knock on wood, hopefully, uh, as long as we get that permission from the FDA, we have to treat individuals who actually have the underlying condition. It can't be healthy volunteers. Mavic Hampton, you know, Tassos and Myocardia back in the day, they had a small molecule approach. It, I know they, they call it precise and it has an interesting mechanism, but it's not really precise in the context of myvc 3 It does nothing for the myfc 3 mutation, right? It does something for the sarcomeres, but it doesn't do anything for the myfc 3 mutation. So, uh, so but let me they pause there for just a yeah. second because now we're going to get people a little bit confused. I promise you we will have a webinar that will explain this in detail, of course. Yeah. but think about it as a layered approach. Mm -hmm. First, the gene is malfunctioning for a number of different reasons. And that malfunctioning gene causes the sarcomere to not function well. So if we're, we're we've gotten down to the point where we can treat the sarcomere with with myosin inhibitors, and that's that's great, but we want to go deeper than that. We want to go to the underlying mechanism of why the sarcomere is abnormal to begin with. Yeah. So we'll I, I explain think that's the science point. later, but that's yeah. We'll go into the science later. I you know I, an imperfect analogy would be that if your um, 
if the defect in your, if you imagine your cell in your heart as a house and you're trying to get to the top floor and you're missing a staircase, that's the myc 3 protein, that's the staircase that you're missing. What, what the myosin inhibitor is such an important development, by the way, I'm so pleased that that got approved earlier this year. That's so great that there's now a new option available for the HCM community. So it's a real advancement where none existed. Uh, so this is, not, this is absolutely deep appreciation for the work that Tassos and Myocardia and the group did in, in partnership, Lisa, with you in the community. Such an important development. And what that got us to is at least got you to knocking on the door of the house. At least you're at the house, right? The house. You're at the house. You know, that's precision. And what we're saying is, but now we want to open the door and go inside and give you the staircase that gets you to the top floor, gets you to your bedroom, gets you to exactly where you need to be. And that's what we're trying to do. It's taking to that next level of precision that you're not just at the front of the house, but you're inside and you've 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 put in something that was missing in that house. That's a little bit of the a, a, a layman's way of describing what we're trying to do. Put something into the house that's missing. And so that's yeah. what we're doing here. And yes, that will be, so we will be hopefully testing um, um, you know, this out in humans next year. It's very exciting. We do have small molecules. As I said, we follow the science. We do have small molecules as well, but for other conditions, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, the FDA recently accepted our application for that. And we're going to test that small molecule in healthy volunteers first. And that's happening as we speak. We'll have data on that next year. Um, but for this program, we uh, we have publicly said we will file an IND by the second half, but, but before the end of the year. And if that's accepted, we will be looking to dose patients uh, uh, in, the, in the first half of next year. And uh, that's why it's a great time to be talking to the community, um, starting with me. But over time, I hope you get to meet others and the community gets to meet our chief medical officer and our science and other we'll people. We'll bring Witt in. What's coming? We're working. Yeah, we're working tirelessly on this. So I'm going to go back in time a little sure. bit further than that 2014 time zone. I, I can time it because it was, I spoke at the personalized medicine conference. It was at Ohio State University and it was the evening of the Obama McCain debate. I think it was their first debate. So you can go back and see when that happened and that's the timeline. And I was speaking at this conference, um, it's gotta be 15, you know, 15, 17 years ago. And we talked about dreams for personalized medicine. And it was a unique audience that I was speaking to because it was cancer genetics. It was, it was cardiac, it was pretty much everything. And I remember putting my mutation up and a picture of my daughter at age seven when she was diagnosed genetically. And she was, you know, a teenager by that point or you know, like maybe 13. And now my daughter's 27. And, you know, I thought that, well, if I could do anything to stop the disease in her before I had her, that would have been great. But the thought of being able to stop disease in somebody who has manifested HCM mildly um, we have a question here about um, can you expect somebody with like scarring to to benefit from this? We'll talk about that in a second. But we're if you told me back in 2008 that genetic therapies would not only happen in my lifespan, but not terribly far in the future, I would have said you were probably a little too excited about a concept. But I've seen this play out. I've, I've watched the Dannon's disease experience mm -hmm. and what Rocket Pharmaceutical has done. And I've been watching very, very closely. In fact, I had a conversation with Rocket earlier this week. And there are a lot of options coming for the HCM spectrum of disorders. You know, we really have to think about our disease not as a single pinpoint diagnosis. So if you look at HCM and say it's one in 250, that doesn't sound very rare, but when you understand that only a certain number of people have this mutation versus that mutation, yeah. and they're all a little different, it's yeah. better to think of us as a spectrum of disorders. And these options for therapies are right here. They're right on the precipice. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of exciting. It's kind of exciting. You know, people, there's a saying, right? People tend to uh, overestimate what can be accomplished in the near term, but they tend to underestimate what can be accomplished in the long term, and so I think with genetic therapies, that's sort of like there's been this sort of um, 
a little bit of hype of, and then, and, you know, like, oh, we're, it's going to be five years away, five years away, and five years away. And then it always got pushed out another five years. But now we're at a point where it's no longer five years away. It's months away, right? This is coming to a center near you. And we have already been engaging with the community. Maybe some people here on this, 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 uh, uh, this session today, we launched a natural history study, uh, particularly focused on children, because that's where we saw a gap. We saw a lot of unmet need among children below 18, but we didn't find a lot of information, for example, in the share registry, or at least not enough on patients with the MyBC3 or individuals with the MyBC3 mutation. So we launched something called the MyClimb study. You go to our website, you'll find it. Um, on our website as well. Yep, the MyClimb study. Uh, and that is recruiting patients uh, actually in sites around the world to begin to, people who are 18 and below who have this mutation to better understand the actual disease biology. Why is it that these children are, even though they have the same mutation, are presenting faster, right? We know with the double homozygous kids, why they, I mean, just they just don't have the protein. And so they are unfortunately lost to us in the first weeks to months of life. But if you have a single mutation, why is it that the adults may present at the time horizon they present, and maybe some are asymptomatic, but the children, they're presenting faster and more severe. And why is that? And what can we do for them? So we have a natural history study. It's not a treatment study. It's an observational. It's, a, it's an opportunity to understand. And that's one easy way anybody here today who has MyBC3 in their family, and they have people who are less than 18, it's an easy way to get involved and contribute to the community and contribute to science is by being willing to have your data pooled in with the data of others around the world. No treatment just observation and science. And so that's a, that's a call for you know, the people here uh, uh, joining today or who might listen to this later. If you've got it in your family and you know of kids 18 or below or adolescents and kids 18 below, absolutely an opportunity to contribute to science uh, with that. And then our treatment study will start um, into next year. I'm gonna so, dial uh, back a little bit and yeah. just kind of bring everything into focus here. Um, at least for me. In 1995, tragedy set me on a path that I did not plan on taking. And that led me to start an organization. Who would have thought? Um, this is not the business model that I envisioned. And mm -hmm. it's evolved and it's grown beyond my expectations and it continues to. But at that point, if you were to look back and, okay, what, what did I see as the problem, the unmet need? Where did I need to be disruptive? There were not enough care centers. There were not enough doctors and healthcare professionals who understood HCM. So we started to network and we started to develop. Back then, there were five programs in the United States that had a focus interest in HCM and a couple in the world beyond that. Today, the HCMA has... 46 HCMA recognized centers of excellence and the development of these programs has an alternative meaning. Yes, we want people to get excellent care, but we also want people to have the opportunity to participate in high quality clinical trials that are going to lead us to better management and hopefully disease eradication. So 27 years ago, I had this idea that these companies would potentially come and we could have the patients in silos so we'd be ready for clinical trials and ready for development and discovery. And here we are today, um, a concept has played out. Every one of our centers are great opportunities for clinical trial sites, and we've developed them out with that in mind. They give mm -hmm. good care and you can do clinical trials and we all advance together. Yep. Um, if there's anything that I've ever done right in my life, I think that's one of them. Lisa, it done more than right. I've had the the, the great privilege to work with the rare disease communities in many different therapeutic areas, the brain, the eye, um, you know, liver, muscle, and now, now the heart uh, for over 20 plus years uh, around the world. And uh, it all starts and stops with families, individuals like yourself who bang on the door of the healthcare system and saying, look here, pay attention to us. You don't yet fully understand us. What you're telling us may not actually be right. You know, we're telling you something different. So all progress depends on unreasonable people, as some people say. And uh, and I think in this way, being 
a loud voice on behalf of the community is exactly what the HCM community needs and what the DCM community and the ARVC community and all the other communities in the heart genetic art space need because people haven't paid attention before. We needed organizations like you. And I'll say the same thing here that I've already said to you, Lisa, and that I've said to others. ATMA is light years ahead of where other sister peer organizations are in other therapeutic areas. Um, meaning, you know, when I looked at some of the others uh, I've met over time, many of them were mom and pop shops, really, really, really committed and dedicated mom and pops, but they hadn't figured out how to do it uh, at scale and do it in a way that, you know, gets the attention of the healthcare system and the policymakers. You've done that. So the HCMA community and we owe a debt of gratitude to the uh, HCMA and to you, at least on your leadership in this regards. And that's my call to this community. Be loud, be unreasonable bang on our doors too, right? Yep. We're here to listen to you and to serve you. And so, you know, you need to continue to be your own best advocate. And many, many times it's the individuals and the families who've been affected with these conditions who know best what they're experiencing. And then that's why I say listening to the community leads to good medicine. It can influence our thinking to hear what you're experiencing. That's partly why we launched that natural history study in children. Because yeah. as we talked to people, we started going, wait, but there are all these kids and what do we know about the kids? So we did that because of you. We did that because we heard from the community and they're saying, you know, but nobody seems to be able to ex explain what my child is going through and why they're presenting so much faster than I am. Or I have two children and one is, seems pretty normal, asymptomatic. And another is super severe and needed an ICD at the age of two. Why? And so the community is, and your advocacy, incredibly important. So I'm glad to say that even though there are other diseases other than hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, obviously I'm very focused on that. We're actually partnering with the, the Dilated Cardiomyopathy Foundation and their founder, Greg Graff, on projects that he's working on. We're working with the SADS Foundation and they're working in ARVC. As advocates, we work together. Yeah. Rising waters raises all ships. We mm -hmm. have some amazing partners. We learn from them. They learn from us. I've got a little bit more experience than some of them did in terms of how to organize and how to get things going. I'm like, here, best practices. Here's what we do. How can we help you do better? Because we want to help people. We want to help people with genetic heart disorders. And there are many of them. And mm -hmm. I'm going to take a plug here for our legislative initiative, the HCM Act, which is the Healthy Cardiac Monitoring Act. We want every child in their well child exam to be asked about their family heart health history. We wanna be able to identify all of these families earlier regardless of disease state. So those are some of the initiatives that we're working on to help identify more families and patients before tragedy strikes. We don't need to have those bad things happen. We can identify, we can treat, we can modify risk and we can keep families whole. That's the goal. Look, our, our, you know, Tanaya, I talked about the science and how we're put together, but in terms, I think it's really important. I'd want your community to hear this. Um, we're guided by some pretty important values and cultural norms. You know, scientific excellence is one of them and a very, very deep commitment to science focus on heart disease. And patients first, putting patients first is an important value. And I'd say a lot of companies say that. Uh, and uh, I'd like to, uh, say that we would like to prove that in, when it comes to us, we really mean it and we're going to try to show with our actions that we really mean it. And that means partnership with you, Lisa, and the other advocacy organizations and the individuals who are joining this call who might reach us to us later. It truly is a partnership. You can't get this done with any one player. You kind of, you need diagnostics. You need centers of excellence. You need therapeutics. You need legislation and policy. Eventually, we're going to want newborn screening for some yep. of these conditions, right? But that won't happen unless we have some hope from therapies. And the therapies won't happen unless we have individuals and families ready to try it out on themselves or on their loved ones. And that won't happen unless we work together to educate people on gene therapies and genetic therapies, which I know we'll do over time. So it really takes a village. It really takes all of us working together uh, to, to make this all work. It, it sounds so daunting, like when you start layering it out like this, 
But if you're systematic, and, and I guess this comes back to where I started my career from, which is human resource management, health plan development, that kind of how do you build the organization? And if you build the organization and you put the right people at the right places to do the right things at the right time, you slowly build. It's a little harder to do that in the nonprofit world. We can't go out for venture capital money, but they can donate. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. They can donate. Um, and for us, I'm going to give you a last minute or two to wrap things up. And then I have some final comments for today. Sure. So what else didn't we cover? We Believe it or not, we had these five questions. I'm like, we're going to go over these, but we're just going to talk and we're going to have this great conversation. Talk and that's okay. Hour's going to fly. The hour yeah. flew and we're at the end. Yeah, we're at the end. Right. And we can look, we can always do this again. We can all, we will, this, was, this is the first, but not the last time we'll engage. Um, you know, I'm hoping that people today got a sense of uh, Tanaya and who we are, what we're trying to do. Um, we are a different kind of company, can't be compared to any other. Um, we are doing unique science. We are focused on the heart. TN201 is something that is, uh, should be near and dear to many hearts over here, no pun intended. Um, on, no on puns completely intended, go ahead. In the, in, including, including you and your family, Lisa. And um, we've got some outstanding data that my guess is not, it's not easy to understand because they've been presented for scientific audiences. So part of our job is to create the opportunities for the community to reach out to us through you or directly so we can do a better job of explaining that science. It's coming to a center near you. And um, we, we, we know that you're not just gonna sign up overnight. So it requires people talking to each other. So for those of you who are interested in the natural history study and participating and contributing to science without uh, getting a, a medicine yet, um, you know, reach out to us, Go re reach out to Wendy Bersari, who many of you know, reach out Contact to us. Contact information is on our website. It's on our website. If you're potentially interested in gene therapy and being involved in a first in human study, um, you know, we're going to be looking for people who meet certain criteria, and that's just to get started. To get started, you got to, you know, the FDA requires you to say, you got to have, you got to meet these requirements, and you got to not have these things. And so it sort of takes the broader community and shrinks it to a smaller bite-sized chunk that you go after first. But that doesn't mean that's all who we intend to treat. So early on, we'll focus on adults, and early on, we'll focus on people with truncating mutations. But as we go from there and develop early insights on safety and efficacy, then we'll expand and we'll start including other people and in in broadening the circle. We'll start including children. We'll include obstructive and non-obstructive. We'll include, so we got to well, we, start somewhere. And yeah. you know, it's, it's important for us to hear from those who might be interested, important for us to have a chance to explain the science, because I'm sure many of you have many questions. We are all about patients and we, we want to have a dialogue with you. And so that's what today is an opportunity to do. That's where we're, we're here. And we'd like to continue the dialogue with you afterwards. Um, and uh, look, we, you know, in the future calls, we can talk about, I know you we'll, want we'll to talk about- We'll get more into the how and the details later. The details, how very, is very technical. Technical going to go? How long is this going to take? How much is it going to cost? I think we'll get there. Uh, Lisa, it'll take time for us and subsequent conversations to get to those points. But and I think I, for that conversation, uh, we will do more webinar format so that there can be visuals and people exactly. can really take I think that'd be very that helpful. We, we, we welcome that. Um, we, yeah. we really want to hear from you and really want to speak with you and engage with you authentically. <clears throat> so I'm going to cut, cut to a couple of points for me as a wrap up. You mentioned, you know, how partnership is great. And, you know, you know, I'm a disruptive healthcare kind of person, how we shake things up. Um, I don't say yes to every partnership. I don't work personally with certain types of individuals or certain ethics. Um, I really want to make sure that the people that the HCMA are partnering with are people that I really feel have the best interest of not only the global community, but I always have to answer the question, what would I do with my own family? What would I do with my own decisions? Is this something that makes sense? And if I'm not sure who are the people that I can ask who understand the science in a different way or a deeper way or a better way than I do, and I, I lean on those advisors and those are members of our boards and our committees and they help the HCMA be the, be the voice that it is. It's not just me at the, at the doing all of this work. So we have this amazing team behind us now, but at the core, I'm still the founder and CEO and I'm still a Jersey girl. 
So anybody like says something that doesn't sit right, they're going to get questioned. They're going to get a call on their cell phone. What is going on with this? And I'm going to expect an answer. And I get them. And I think that that communication is critical at the highest level of the organization to every staff member. And I've met many of your staff members already and I'll meet more. And I'm looking forward to having longstanding relationships that really provide meaningful outcomes for patients. So um, that's gives you a little bit of understanding of how I work and how we choose at the HCMA to go into sponsorships and partnerships with different organizations. Um, I do want to take a moment to bring up a couple of other points um, that are not related to today's conversation. Number one, I'm really excited that we launched something this week. On January 9th, 2022, I opened the Lori Fund. Um, it was meant to provide micro travel grants to individuals seeking care at HCMA recognized centers of excellence or associated transplant programs. And this is to provide hotel accommodations, air, trains, gas money, food on the road, ground transportation, whatever you needed to get from your home to the center to ensure that you're getting the highest quality of care you could possibly get. Um, they're limited to $600 per year per family. And we've raised enough money in the fund to start taking applications effective this week. So if you are in need of getting to a center of excellence and cost has been the, the barrier, please apply for a travel grant, set an appointment. There will be some file, you know, you'll have to provide some financial information. It is for low income individuals only. And uh, we will provide those grants to you. And we ask for two weeks time to process and check and do our due diligence but it's available. And if you want to donate to the Lori Fund, you can always go straight to the website and do so. Those funds go directly to patients with a small administration fee taken off the top so we can pay for it to continue going. Um, and if you really want to have fun on October 22nd in Parsippany, New Jersey, we are holding the Unmask the Great Masquerader Ball with proceeds going to the Lori Fund. So come in your cocktail attire and your fancy masks. If you're watching on Facebook, one of my masks, I have a couple of them for the night, is sitting behind me here. So think about a, a classy Halloween themed event and cocktail dresses and cool masks. So I encourage you all to come out if you can. I think Eli should come out. Eli should come to the Unmasked the Great Masquerader Pool and others should as well. I know we have a lot of questions in the chat here um, and I'm going to answer a lot of them uh, in text form because we're running a little bit over on time. Please, by all means, send them to us and we'd be happy to, to the extent that they're about tonight in our science or TN201, we would be more than willing to respond to them, send them to you. You can pass them on. If people want to send directly to us, you'll find us responsive. So I, I will um, leave this by saying um, my, my family continues to grow down the HCM line and there's little ones now and their status is currently unknown. And um, I'm really not as apprehensive about their futures because there's so many wonderful therapies for HCM now and families like mine who have encountered a lot of tragedy um, don't have to think that the future has to be like the past. And that's pretty extraordinary. So thank you to the entire team at Tanaya. Thank you for spending the time with us this morning and sharing your insights and letting us know a little bit more about Tanaya. More to come, starting point. And I really appreciate you being on Tales from the Heart today. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. We um, we um, look forward to partnership with you and with your community. It will take all of us working together to bring new hope of new new science forward. And uh, I really we're, we're authentically committed to engaging with you. We have a speak up culture here at Tanaya, which is anybody can say anything if it's intended well, even if it's hard to hear. I think that fits very well. I think Lisa, with what you said, is you speak your you speak your mind. You're a Jersey girl. So that works well. The way what you and your community are bringing to the table fits very well with who we are as a company committed to advancing new science for patients. So I look forward to the partnership and look forward to more opportunities like this. Absolutely. I think we're going to do extraordinary things. And on that note, 
Thank you very much for joining us on Facebook. And this episode of Tales from the Heart is a wrap.